Good evening, everyone. It's a privilege to be able to welcome you to the beginning of our Lenten series. It's a privilege to be able to welcome not only you, but also parishioners who are at home, uh, perhaps wisely so because of the conditions of the roads and the cold temperatures. And I welcome also those who are joining us from afar. I know that uh, we have some who are watching from Texas, where it might be colder than it is here in Indiana, who knows, some from Canada, and also we have some, at least one person from England uh, watching in on us. So it's good to be together as we begin our Lenten series. Let's begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for the blessings of this night, as well as the blessings of this season of Lent. We pray that this season will be a time for the whole church to turn away from sin and to turn to you, to restore those practices of good discipline and devotion that help us to offer to you glory and praise and honor. We ask that you watch over families who are in any sort of difficulty, especially those who are struggling because of the weather. We ask that you watch over our Chin families during this time of need in their home country. Hold them, dear Lord, in the palm of your hand. And we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So again, welcome. And at the beginning, I want to do an overview of our program for the season of Lent. The intent of this program is to spend one evening on each of the four days of the Triduum, the Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and Easter Sunday. And so tonight we will talk about Holy Thursday, asking specifically what was the Last Supper? What was going on at the Last Supper? And then next time we will talk about Good Friday with special emphasis upon what we can learn from the San Damiano crucifix. That's the crucifix that was displayed at the beginning of the evening. It's the crucifix that once hung at the church of San Damiano in Assisi. And it was at that crucifix that St. Francis prayed as a young man. And the crucifix spoke to him saying, Francis, rebuild my church. We'll take a close look at that crucifix to see what it has to tell us about the importance and the meaning of Good Friday. The next session will be focused on Holy Saturday and the burial of the Lord and his descent into hell. That's a phrase in the creed that can be confusing and we'll drill into that and what that means. We'll also take a look at the place of his burial and that will tie in to the session for Easter Sunday, which is the empty tomb and recent research that was done into the Church of the Holy Sepulcher and specifically the tomb of our Lord, the place where that has been honored for centuries as the place where our Lord was buried and on the third day rose from the dead. Some very, very interesting research that was done and recorded in the National Geographic in December of 2017. And the research that is put in the National Geographic magazine is also part of a video that we will see on that fourth night, The Secrets of Christ's Tomb, an explorer special from the National Geographic Society. Now, I need a word of explanation to those who are watching at home. We have the video and copyright laws allow us to show the video here in church in its entirety. We have to show the video from beginning 
to end without interruption, without editing. It's a 45 minute video, so that's manageable. We have permission to show this here in church. We do not have permission to blast it out on the internet to the four corners of the world. We can't do that. So I would suggest that if you're interested in seeing this, that you locate a copy of this DVD called Secrets of Christ's Tomb from the National Geographic Society. You can, you can find it if you search for it. It might be in your local library. You may wish to obtain a copy for your own home. It's, a, it's well worth it. It's about $20 retail. Uh, you might be able to find it for less than that. We will have some copies available here at church. If you're in the neighborhood, if you wish to come by and watch the video, or you can, you can do that um, at your leisure. We'll have copies available for here, but if you're far away, you'll wanna pick up a copy of this DVD. I will put this image back up on the screen toward the end of the program. So we will go from Holy Thursday to Good Friday to Holy Saturday to Easter Sunday over the course of the four evenings of our Lenten uh, program. Beginning tonight with Holy Thursday and the fourth cup. This is research that was done by Scott Hahn. Some of you know the name of Scott Hahn, a very famous convert from evangelical Christianity to Catholicism. In fact, he was not only an evangelical Christian, he was an anti-Catholic evangelical Christian. He learned how to preach against the Catholic Church. And that's what he saw his mission in life as being until he came across some questions that he could not answer apart from the wisdom of the Catholic Church. And after a, a long battle interiorly that he tells in, the, in, the, in his story, the book is called Rome, Sweet Home. It's a very beautiful book. Uh, he tells of his story of, of becoming Catholic and how things were made very, very clear. Scott Hahn is a scripture scholar and he does a study in this book called The Fourth Cup where he shows conclusively my point for this evening is that there is a very, very, very strong connection between what takes place in the upper room at the Last Supper and what takes place at Calvary on Good Friday. That there is a profound connection that helps us to make sense of the fact that our church has taught consistently that the Holy Mass instituted at the Last Supper by Jesus is indeed the sacrifice of Christ upon the cross at Calvary, represented on the altar, albeit in an unbloody manner. This is distinctively Catholic. This is rejected by the vast majority of Protestants who see the Last Supper as a memorial, something by which to remember the Lord. That's not enough for us. We say, yes, it is a memorial. It is also a sacrifice. And Dr. Dr. Hahn's research makes that very, very clear. And I want to unpack that tonight and show what his research has to say about the Last Supper and why we say that the Last Supper concludes, not at the end of the meal in the upper room, but the next day at Calvary when Jesus says it is finished. That the Last Supper, the institution of the Holy Eucharist, takes not simply a few hours in the upper room on Thursday, but it takes through the fulfillment of his sacrifice for the redemption of the world. We'll get into this. What is Passover? If we're gonna talk about the Last Supper and Holy Thursday, we're talking about Passover. The scriptures are very, very clear that everything that took place 
in the, in the death and resurrection of the Lord took place at Passover time and that the Last Supper was a Passover meal. So what was, what is Passover? The word for Passover in Hebrew is Pesach. This is very, very similar to the word for Easter in Italian and in Spanish. Pasqua, Buona Pasqua is said in Italy on Easter Sunday. Pasqua in Spanish. We have a word in English, Paschal, from which we get the term Paschal mystery, the mystery of Passover, or rather the new Passover that involves the institution of the Eucharist, the crucifixion, and the resurrection of the Lord. All of that is encompassed within the Paschal mystery. In the English language, Easter is Easter. It's related to the German Oster, it's a different branch of, of, of language, uh, but the Romance languages have the connection between their way of saying Easter and how the Jews refer to Passover or Pesach, Pasqua, Pasqua, Paschal. Pa the Passover to this day is the high point of the year for Jewish families. Jewish families gather in a home. People come home for Passover. Uh, just as we sometimes go crazy with our Christmas decorations, you know, box after box of Christmas decorations, sometimes renting out storage units to keep all the extra lights, Jewish families can do the same with the dishes that they use for Passover. There's always a special set of dishes for the Passover meal. Everyone makes a point to get to the Passover meal that is offered in a home. Uh, the foods are very, very special, and there's an allegorical meaning to the different foods, the, the bitter herbs that represent the bitterness of slavery in Egypt, the lamb that represents the Paschal lamb that the Lord asked them to sacrifice and eat. The Passover meal has a certain menu that is expected, and that is common to the way Jews celebrate the Passover meal. And it always involves bread and wine, unleavened bread, and four cups of wine. Not three cups, not five cups, but four cups of wine, each one with its own meaning. And by the way, the unleavened bread is actually eaten for a week after Passover. It's, it's eaten at the Passover meal and then for a full week, they will eat only unleavened bread as a reminder of how they ate unleavened bread during their sojourn in the desert during the Exodus. The four cups are so very, very important in Dr. Hahn's study, the fourth cup especially. The part of the Passover meal that is the conclusion of the meal, the fourth cup. What is Passover? As you know, the origin is in Exodus, the book of Exodus that tells of the exodus of the people of Israel from slavery in Egypt through the 40 years in the desert until they get to the promised land. The Passover meal is commanded by the Lord with great specificity. We find this in the 12th chapter of the book of Exodus. And we read from this passage at Holy Thursday Mass. Uh, the ritual is prescribed. Uh, the, uh, the date of Easter, which always corresponds with a time around the, the full moon that occurs after the vernal equinox, the, uh, the first day of spring. Our triduum takes place at the same time. In fact, at the end of Holy Thursday Mass, when you're going outside back to your car, look up in the sky, you will see a full moon or a nearly full moon because the feast of Passover was to take place on that first full moon after the first day of spring. Uh, 
If a family is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join the nearest household in procuring one and shall share in the lamb. The lamb must be a year old male and without blemish. Uh, take some of its blood and apply it to the doorposts and the lintel of every house. That same night they shall eat its roasted flesh with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. It shall not be eaten raw or boiled, but roasted whole with its head and shanks and inner organs. None of it must be kept beyond the next morning. This is how you are to eat it, with your loins girt, sandals on your feet, and staff in hand. You shall eat like those who are in flight. It is the Passover of the Lord. The Lord is very specific in how the people of Israel are to eat this Passover meal on the eve of their departure from Egypt. It is, of course, a highly significant event, the kind of event that really defines the people of Israel, making them no longer slaves, but free people with their own destiny, living in the promised land. Notice that it is a lamb that is sacrificed. In fact, a lamb without blemish, a lamb with, uh, of, of which none of its bones are broken. It's a perfect sacrifice. The blood is placed on the doorpost. The blood is placed on the doorpost so that the people living beyond the doorposts will be saved from the angel of death. The people then are saved by the blood of the lamb. That should ring some bells for us. We who follow the Lamb of God, Jesus our Savior. The blood is placed on the doorpost and the lamb is eaten. The lamb is sacrificed, yes. Part of the lamb is burned and goes up in smoke up to, up to the heavens and the rest is eaten by the human family. There's a sense in which there is a communion between God and his people. They share the same meal. They share the same animal. There is a communion that just as a family shares the same meal, so now God shares a meal with his human family. And notice that the Passover meal is eaten with traveling clothes on. They are getting ready for a journey. Uh, if you've ever gone on a long journey, a transatlantic flight perhaps, you know, you kind of get ready the night before. You get everything lined up and maybe even, maybe even you wake up and ready to go to the airport. In the same way, they would eat the Passover meal with their sandals on, with their walking staffs. They're ready to go out the door to the, the land that the Lord has in store for them. There's a certain structure of the Passover meal that's important to remember, centered around the four cups, the four glasses of wine. And just so you know, you can usually get five glasses out of a bottle of table wine. And so if you're familiar with drinking that quantity of wine, spread out over the course of two or three hours, because that would have been the length of the meal. It wasn't a quick snack. That's what people would consume. They were expected to drink a little something out of each of the four cups. It wasn't required that they drink all of it. The, it was not an exercise in drunkenness by any means. It was a family celebration in which wine was shared. So what is the structure? The structure is that the meal begins with the blessing of the first cup of wine, the cup of sanctification, sanctification, making holy, blessing. The meal begins with a blessing, just as we begin our meals with bless us, O Lord. The first cup introduces the family to the uh, to, the, uh, to the Passover meal, sometimes called a Seder meal. Sometimes that word is used. That's the first cup. The second part of the Passover meal is a remembrance of the Passover event itself. 
a recitation of the narrative of the Passover, the flight from Egypt. Sometimes this takes place in the context of a dialogue. The youngest child will ask the father of the household, why is this night different from all the rest? And from the answer, the story of the Passover is told. There's a recitation of the 113th Psalm, one of the Psalms of praise. And then the second cup of wine is consumed. After the narrative of the Passover is read, the second cup is consumed, then comes the main course, the lamb, and the Lord uh, uh, commanded how the lamb was to be prepared, and the unleavened bread, and the third cup of wine. It is called the cup of blessing, the cup of redemption even. The third cup, so significant, the cup of blessing. In fact, that is the term used by St. Paul when he speaks of the early celebration of the Holy Eucharist in Corinth in his first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 11. Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord will have to answer for the body and blood of the Lord. A person should examine himself and so eat the bread and drink the cup. St. Paul is speaking of the seriousness of of that which is shared. Let's look at chapter 10 instead. Chapter 10, verse 16 of 1 Corinthians. The cup of blessing that we bless? Is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? St. Paul is referring to the blessing cup, the cup of blessing, the third cup. Following the third cup comes the, the psalms, the psalms of praise, the great Hallel, Psalms 114 to 118, and the fourth cup of wine is consumed, and the Passover meal is finished. These are indeed psalms of great praise of God, and you can read these yourselves, but Psalm 114, for example, when Israel came forth from Egypt, the Passover, the house of Jacob from an alien people, Judah became God's holy place, Israel, God's domain. The sea beheld and fled, the sea beheld and fled. The Red Sea opened up so the people could walk through. Uh, Beautiful, beautiful hymns of praise. Uh, The heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth is given to us, Psalm 115. The dead do not praise the Lord, all those gone down in silence. It is we who bless the Lord, both now and forever. More and more praise. I kept faith when I said, I am greatly afflicted. I said in my alarm, no one can be trusted. This is Psalm 116, verse 10. How can I repay the Lord for all the good done for me? I will raise the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. Beautiful, beautiful words of praise. And these would have been sung. The book of Psalms is a book of songs. They're the lyrics to songs. And there are 150 psalms. And it would have been very common for Jewish people back then to have memorized all 150 Now we say, how on earth could somebody memorize that many psalms? First of all, they're poetry. And second of all, they're set to music. And I bet that if we were to sit down and try to come up with 150 sing-along songs, we could probably come pretty close. 
all the songs we've heard on the radio, all the songs we've sung throughout the years, we could probably uh, at least do a couple of verses of 150 songs. The Jewish people would have sung these psalms morning, noon, and night in their prayer. They would have been part of their very soul. And so they would have gone out to sing. They would have gone to sing the psalms, the great Hallel, the praise songs, and then consume the fourth cup of wine and the Passover was over. This is how we would have expected the Last Supper to end. But what happened? I'll hold you in suspense just for a moment and take a little excursus to the most famous image of the Last Supper, the one painted by Leonardo da Vinci. This is the one that we see in artwork and we see this in churches and sometimes we see it at the base of an altar. It's very, very beautiful. This is what it looks like in person. It is painted in a refectory, a dining room for a religious house in Milan. And the reason they are all sitting on the same side of the table, that always seems strange to me, is because in this dining room, the tables would have been arranged in a U-shaped fashion with the abbot and the prior and the sub-prior all sitting up front underneath the image of the Last Supper and the tables that stretch out all the, all the monks, all the religious, beginning with the, the eldest coming all the way down to the youngest. Uh, sitting at the end. They would have sat at that U-shaped table and Leonardo da Vinci wanted to do the image of the Last Supper this way to remember that every meal that is shared in common reflects in some way the meal that our Lord shared with his apostles and that they were indeed in the presence of their abbot, they were indeed in, pre in the presence of the Lord. Chances are the Last Supper did not look like what Leonardo da Vinci depicted, but rather something like this. It was a U-shaped table. They would have been reclining at table, sitting on the ground on, on pillows, uh, eating, eating with one hand, and uh, in, that, in that fashion, sitting in a U-shaped fashion so that the service could be brought to, the, to each one from the middle of the table. That's just an excursion, uh, excursus about what the Last Supper would have looked like. So the Last Supper, we expect it to follow the pattern of the Passover meal with the four cups. The first two cups are assumed in the text. St. Mark does not go into telling what happened with the first cup and what happened with the second cup Everybody knew the ritual. Everybody knew what was going to happen with the first cup and the second cup. He begins his narrative of the Last Supper uh, by saying, while they were eating, while they were partaking of this Passover meal, Yes, verse 22, my typist made a little mistake there. Imagine that, I'll have to get after my typist for this. It's not verse 12, but verse 22. Chapter 14, verse 22. While they were eating, he took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them and said, take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, gave thanks, gave it to them, and they all drank from it. He said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which will be shed for many. This is the blood of the covenant, which will be shed for many. Amen, I say to you, I shall not drink again the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Now, a couple of things are happening here. First of all, the importance of the Passover meal 
in reference to the events of the past, the Passover meal being a remembrance of the Passover from slavery in Egypt to the promised land, that focus is readjusted to focus upon something new. Our Lord adapts the Passover. He uses the structure. He uses some of the elements, especially the bread and the wine, but he changes it. He changes an ancient ritual, an ancient, very familiar ritual, something that everyone in the room would have been part of every single year throughout their whole life. He makes a change because he is instituting a new covenant. This is a new Passover, a new Exodus. This is something new that he is introducing and instituting. But after that third cup, I shall not drink again the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Then, after singing a hymn, after singing a hymn, after singing the Halal Psalms, Psalms 114, 115, 116, and 117, these beautiful hymns that they knew by heart, after singing a hymn, they drank the fourth cup, they went out to the Mount of Olives. No reference is made to the fourth cup. No reference is made to the drinking of the fourth cup. In fact, just the opposite. After the third cup, Jesus says, I shall not drink again the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Can the Passover meal be finished without the consummation of the fourth cup? It would be the first time in history, the first time that a Passover meal was declared over before that fourth cup was used. Jesus goes out to the Mount of Olives with Peter and James and John. This is an image of the Mount of Olives, the Garden of Gethsemane that contains olive trees that are close to, close to 17 or 1800 years old. The olive tree has a remarkable root structure. You can cut a, an olive tree down to the ground and what will happen? A shoot shall sprout. It will come back to life again and grow and it will grow and grow and grow. The tree that's in the center there, it would take two men to have their arms all the way around it holding hands uh, and they might not all get, get around it. The Mount of Olives overlooks the city of Jerusalem. Our Lord would have been praying, looking out over the temple that was so dear to him. This is depicted in some works of art showing the the uh, Garden of Gethsemane. That's the temple in the background. What happens when the Lord prays? What does he pray? Jesus is very clear about his intention to skip the last cup, the fourth cup. In fact, he prays, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but thy will be done. Three cups of wine are consumed in the Last Supper. The third cup being the cup by which the Holy Eucharist is instituted. This is the cup of my blood. This is my body. The fourth cup is not consumed in the usual fashion. But notice what Jesus is praying about. Let this cup pass from me. 
let me get out of here without completing the task at hand. Let me get out of here without finishing what I have begun. In fact, his dear friends, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, lived just on the other side of the Mount of Olives, away from Jerusalem, away from all the authorities. He could have made it from the Garden of Gethsemane to the house of Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. He could have made it there in, in 30 minutes. He could have fled. They would have taken care of him. They would have gotten him out of, out of town. But not as I will, but thy will be done. The fourth cup. He does not drink of the fruit of the vine. He does not drink wine. Even when it is offered to him, as he was being nailed to the cross, as they were getting ready to put the nails in, and they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, and he did not take it. The myrrh, that resiny substance, it would have come from the, the inside of a, of a plant. It, it would have been sort of like, like pine tar that had, had coagulated in a certain way. It was known to be an anesthetic. Mixed with wine, it would have dulled some of the pain from the crucifixion but he does not drink. It's bravery to be sure. There's a deeper meaning as well. It's not just that he refused the pain relief. He did not take it because he said, I will not take it until I have it anew in the kingdom of God. Our Lord hangs upon the cross. Three hours he hangs upon the cross. And then he says, I thirst, I thirst. Of course he'd be thirsty, of course he'd be dehydrated. But St. John does not put any phrase into his gospel without a deeper meaning. In fact, we have the example in modern times of Mother Teresa of Calcutta, St. Teresa of Calcutta in her chapel and in all the chapels of the missionaries of charity around the world, next to the crucifix in their chapel is stenciled or inscribed on the wall, I thirst. Mother Teresa never wanted to forget the thirst of Jesus. The fourth cup, John chapter 19, verse 28, after this, aware that everything was now finished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. There was a vessel filled with common wine. So they put a sponge soaked in wine on a sprig of hyssop and put it up to his mouth. And when Jesus had taken the wine, he said, it is finished. It is finished. One point about the word hyssop. We've already heard that word used tonight in Exodus chapter 12. that describes how the hyssop was used. It was like a reed that had a frayed end. That was what was used to mark the doorposts with the blood of the lamb. St. John is bringing us back to that first Passover as he is speaking about the completion of the Last Supper. What is finished? When Jesus says, it is finished, what is finished? The Passover meal. The Passover meal is finished. The Passover meal that is always completed with the drinking of the fourth cup. I need to go back here just for a second. 
Jesus finished the Passover meal in the upper room, not by drinking the fourth cup of wine. He announced his intention not to drink wine again until he came to the glory of the kingdom. He refused wine right before being nailed to the cross. He received common wine on the cross. And then he said, it is finished. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit. The Passover meal is the, the Last Supper is the Passover meal in which Jesus transforms the Passover sacrifice of the Old Covenant into the Eucharistic sacrifice of the New Covenant. Do we see the connection between the Last Supper and Calvary? How a ritual meal in the upper room, the apostles were expecting a regular Passover meal, just as they had experienced every year at that time since they were babies. They were expecting that, but Jesus transforms it with new words, new meaning. This is my body, this is my blood, the blood of the covenant. And that blood is not simply a metaphor, it's not simply an image. It is blood that will be shed on the cross before the completion of the Passover meal, before the completion of the institution of the Eucharist, blood must be shed. The Eucharist, the Eucharist. The Passover sacrifice of the new covenant began in the upper room with the institution of the Eucharist. His sacrifice as the Passover lamb of the new covenant was not finished until Calvary. Isn't it interesting that in all the things that are mentioned in the Last Supper, no one ever talks about the main course, which is lamb. Why? Because it was the Lamb of God who was presiding at the Last Supper. He is the Lamb of God. The Lamb that is sacrificed and eaten. Not simply sacrificed and left to burn on the altar, but eaten. The flesh of the lamb, the blood of the, the, the flesh of the lamb becomes our flesh. The body and blood of the Lord in, his, in the bread and the wine that become his body and blood become part of our body and blood by our participation in the Holy, Holy Eucharist. Calvary begins with the Eucharist and the Eucharist ends with Calvary which is why we are insistent upon calling the Mass, the sacrament of the Eucharist, a sacrifice and a memorial. It is a memorial. Do this in remembrance of me. Remembrance, memorial, the same. It is a, memori a memorial, but not just a memorial. It is a sacrifice. He institutes the sacrament of the Eucharist to make present once and for all his self-giving, his giving of everything that he can possibly give upon the cross, giving his very body and giving his precious blood for the forgiveness of our sins and as the means by which we can experience communion with him in a most profound way. I want to hammer home the point again, the Eucharist and Passover, the Eucharist and Passover. St. John's Gospel is the only one of the four that does not contain the institution narrative. Jesus saying, this is my body, this is my blood. The other three do this. St. John spends five or six chapters on the, the Last Supper. 
But St. John's Gospel also contains another instance of Passover time. And it is in the very famous sixth chapter of St. John's Gospel, the chapter that describes the miracle of the multiplication of the loaves and fish. St. John begins in chapter six, verses one through four, talking about the crowd that gathers to hear Jesus and the crowd that's following him as he's uh, performing miracles with the sick. They sit down and it says very clearly, the Jewish feast of Passover was near. It was during a Passover time that the miracle of the loaves and fish took place, a miracle that is quite Eucharistic. And in this same chapter of John, chapter six, Jesus gives the bread of life discourse in which he compares his giving of the bread that feeds 5,000 with 12 baskets left over, he compares this to the miraculous manna in the desert that appears after the Passover meal. The Passover meal lasts for a night. The people of Israel go out into the desert for 40 years where they are taken care of by God who gives them bread from heaven, manna, and Jesus says that, uh, that uh, in verse 32 of chapter six, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave the bread from heaven. My father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread that God, of God that it, which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And the people say, give us this bread. And Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. And the people grumble. Who is this? He's saying, uh, I, am, I am the bread of life. And our Lord emphasizes again, whoever eats this bread will live forever. Verse 51, and the bread that I give is my flesh for the life of the world. The people continue to grumble. And then our Lord says in verse 53 of chapter six of John's gospel, amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, where does that come from? Where does that, that come seemingly out of nowhere, but our Lord says it for a reason, because he will give his body and his blood so that we might eat and drink and be that close to him that he is part of us unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. at the place where the multiplication of loaves and fish is said to have taken place along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, there's a beautiful church in Tagba, and in front of the altar is a mosaic depicting the five loaves and the two fish. It's on the floor in front of the altar. It's this mosaic, and as you can tell, there are two fish and five loaves, correct? One, two, three, four. And everybody asked the guide, where is the fifth loaf? That mosaic is on the floor in front of the altar. And the guide always responds, the fifth loaf is on the altar. The fifth loaf is on the altar so that we might participate through the Holy Eucharist in the Lord feeding us with bread from heaven, feeding us with his very body and most precious blood, that this is all part of the teaching on the Eucharist. And so the question of tonight was, what is the Last Supper? 
the Last Supper, the beginning of the sacrifice, the beginning of the sacrifice by which the new covenant is established, the covenant sealed by the blood of the Lamb, sacrificed upon the cross, the Lamb whose body and blood are made present upon the altar in the holy sacrifice of the Mass, the Lamb of whose body and blood we partake when we receive Holy Communion. The Catechism says it much better. By celebrating the Last Supper with his apostles in the course of the Passover meal, Jesus gave the Jewish Passover its definitive meaning. He changed the focus. He changed what was being talked about. He gave it its definitive meaning. Jesus passing over to his Father by his death and resurrection, the new Passover, passing over from death to resurrection, is anticipated in the Supper, the Last Supper, and celebrated in the Eucharist. The Eucharist which fulfills the Jewish Passover and anticipates the final Passover of the church in the glory of the kingdom because the Eucharist will not last forever. The Eucharist will end when we have no more need of sacraments, when sacraments will cease because we have no need of them because we behold our Lord face to face and enjoy perfect communion with him not through the mediation of a sacrament, but by experience him, experiencing him fully as we adore him forever, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, the Holy Eucharist instituted at the Last Supper, a supper, a Passover meal that does not end in the usual sequence, but is finished only when the Lord partakes of the fourth cup, thereby completing the institution of the sacrament through which we are privileged to receive him. Connections, Last Supper and Calvary Holy Eucharist, instituted at the Last Supper, a supper that continues through the next day until the final cup is partaken of. Jesus takes the wine and says, it is finished. Once again, just for the sake of those who are watching at home, I recommend that you Obtain, if possible, a copy of the DVD, Secrets of Christ's Tomb from the National Geographic Society. You might be able to find it on their web page. I understand that those who subscribe to the Disney Plus channel can watch this uh, as part of their subscription. I, I don't sense that I'm sitting in front of a lot of Disney Plus customers, but there may be, there may be uh, children and grandchildren who do subscribe to that. Uh, but we will watch this here and we'll have copies of the DVD available here at the Faith Formation Office uh, so that those who wish to see it can make arrangements to do so. Um, and we will, uh, we, will, we will continue that. That'll be the fourth night. Next time of four days that change the world, we will take a look at this crucifix in detail and it will help us to understand the meaning of that Friday we call good. That is next Thursday at six o'clock Eastern time here in this church for those who are able to gather, live streamed as well. With that, we conclude this presentation. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end, amen.
We have some time for some questions, I think. Joe. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the plan, that's a good question. Will there be any, any discussion regarding the video? The video lasts about 45 minutes. Uh, we won't have a whole lot of time for, for discussion. There may be a few banters back and forth. But the key point is that uh, in the third presentation, I will set up the video. In the third presentation, I'll talk about where he was buried and what you, could, what you can expect to see in the video. So that'll be good for all of us uh, to, to, to go into detail. Uh, the, the National Geographic Society in the magazine and online produced some wonderful uh, uh, three-dimensional images uh, looking, at the, looking at the tomb from different angles peeling back some layers of it to show what it looked like in the first century, what it looked like in the, in the fourth century, and so on, to help us better understand. I'm told that architects have an ability in their mind to be able to look at a building and they, they see rafters, they see structural beams, um, the, the things that we have to look at blueprints to find. We'll kind of look at the blueprints of the, of the tomb and show that the research of 2017 verifies what we have always believed but never been able to prove that the tomb that is venerated as the tomb of Christ, the tomb in which he was laid and three days later he rose from, rose from the dead, never to die again, that that is the tomb. And I believe that I've been studying this for 35 years. I've looked at it from every angle and I truly believe that the tomb that's in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre that we'll study in the video is indeed the tomb of Christ. Other comments or questions while we have time? This is not going out over the, over the, uh, over the air, I don't think, so you don't have to be worried about being embarrassed or anything. Comments, ideas, questions, answers. Going once going twice. Thanks for coming out, everybody. Nice, nice to be with you tonight.